before Stoicism, Socrates, Seneca, Marcus Aurelius was a great ancient Egyptian high-ranking official vizier named Patahotep. Patahotep wrote a group of maxims and teachings to his son that are especially relevant to today. The following is teachings from ancient Egyptian era, 1850 BC, from Patahotep. The 36 maxims presented as advice handed down from a great sage for instructing the ignorant in knowledge and in the correct method of perfect speech deal with a range of different subjects and situations. Nearly a quarter of the maxims advise on how to deal with people of different social status, reflecting the highly hierarchical nature of ancient Egyptian society. In a culture dominated by face-to-face -face oral interactions, knowing when to speak and when to keep quiet was of the utmost importance. Kind of similar today, perhaps. While the importance of being a good listener is hammered home repeatedly, ancient Egypt was a village-based society where lives were shaped by the relationships between and within families and small communities. Hence, there are maxims that address appropriate behavior towards a wife, a son, friends, neighbors, while some deal with lust and greed. In close-knit communities, modesty and moderation in behavior were the key to maintaining social cohesion, as were justice and generosity towards one's fellows. And so there is much practicality and wisdom that we can perhaps take from Patahotep, those many thousands of years ago, that can apply to our society now. We always like to think we're the cleverest chimps in the cage, but really... Much of the philosophy that we purport now has been said in a more wise or realized in a more profound way by those who have come before us. So maybe let's look at the original forebearers of a lot of this wisdom. First maxim, how to deal with an argumentative superior. If you come across a disputatious man in the heat of a moment who has authority over you as a superior, Bend your arms in respect and bow, for if you vex him, he will not be friendly to you. Diminish his bad speech by not opposing him while he is in the heat of the moment. He will be called an ignoramus, while your self-control will equal his wealth. For those who are familiar with my 48 Laws of Power book analysis series by Robert Greene, notice the similarity between Law 1, Never Outshine the Master. Second Maxim how to deal with an argumentative equal. If you come across a disputatious man who is your equal, your match, you will make your esteem greater than his by keeping silent. While he is saying bad things, there will be much discussion by the judges and your name will be good in the opinion of the elders. Third maxim, how to deal with an argumentative subordinate. If you come across a disputatious man who is a poor man, not your equal, do not be aggressive to him simply because he is weak. Leave him alone and he will confute himself. Do not answer him back merely to lighten your heart. Do not vent your anger against your opponent, for wretched he is he who injures a poor man. What you wish will be done or anyway. You will beat him through the elder's disapproval. Notice how in each maxim in dealing with argumentative people, none of it talked about being combative. But all of it talked about staying calm and respectful and patient. Fourth maxim, the exercise of justice. If you are a leader controlling the affairs of many people, seek out every effective deed so that your conduct may be blameless. Justice is great and lasting in effectiveness, unconfounded since the name of Osiris. The one who transgresses laws is punished, though this escapes the greedy and crime never pays. No wrongdoing attains its goal. In the end, it is justice that lasts. A man says, it is my father's ground. Fifth maxim, trust in God. Do not make people terrified. God punishes accordingly. If a man says, I live by it, he will lack bread for his mouth. If a man says, I am powerful, he will have to say, my cleverness has ensnared me. He will have to say, I have ensnared myself. He will not say, I have accomplished my purpose. 
If a man says, I will rob another, he will end up himself being given over to a stranger. People's designs never come to pass. It is God's commands that come to pass. So live peacefully, peacefully, peaceably. What the gods give comes by itself. Sixth maxim, how to behave as a dinner guest. If you are among guests at the place of one greater than you, take what he gives you as it is put in front of you. Look at what it is before you. Don't keep shooting him glances. If he feels put upon, he will be in bad spirits. Do not speak to him until he calls. One never knows what will cause offense. Speak when he has addressed you, then your speech will be pleasing. The elder, when he is at his meal, behaves as his spirit commands. He will give to whomever, whomever he favors. It is the custom of an evening. It is the spirit that makes him extend his hand. The elder gives to the man within reach. Thus, eating is part of God's plan. Only a fool complains about it. In today's society, uh, social customs and, and social etiquette, particularly when you're a guest, it's, not, it's rarely talked about. And there is wisdom here to be said, even though it may be traditional, which is not necessarily should be stigmatized, even though that word often can be. Just because it's traditional doesn't mean it has merit. I know I've transgressed this many times. You know, you test the boundaries. You feel comfortable in your environment. And so you don't just receive what's given to you. You might add a little bit more. You might change it. You might question it. You don't know how what you're questioning and commenting and adding or removing or editing might insult you're the person whose home you are a guest in. And so there is an ultimate respect that I think, particularly my generation and, and people like myself, have overstepped many a time. And it's something I need to remind myself of. Seventh maxim, avoid slander. If you're a man in a position of trust, sent by one elder to another, stick to the matter for which he sent you. Give him the message exactly as he told you. Beware of slanderous speech, which embroils one elder with another. Do not shun the truth, do not go beyond it, but an outburst should not be repeated. Do not speak against anyone, great or small. It is bad for the spirit. Eighth maxim, how to deal with success. If when you plow your fields prosper and God grants you increase, do not be self-satisfied when in your neighbor's company. There is great respect for the silent man. He who possesses character possesses wealth. Let's say that one more time. He who possesses character possesses wealth. Do not make a claim against a man with no children. Do not decry or boast about it. There is many a father in misery and a mother of children less happy than another. God nurtures the lonely, while the one who has a family prays for a follower. There is something to be said about controlling. No, there is something to be said about humility in the face of prosperity particularly when you're around people who do not have what you have. We accidentally and on purpose boastfully express what we have, not realizing or realizing that the other does not. They lack what you have. And that can be ultimately disrespectful. And there is great respect for the silent man. Ninth maxim, how to deal with another success. If you are humble, follow a man of virtue, that all of your conduct may be good before God. Do not think to yourself, he was poor once. Do not be arrogant towards him on account of knowing his former state. Respect him for what he has become. Wealth does not come about by itself. It is the God's law for the one they love. As for his success, he has made it himself. It is God who makes the virtue, or makes his virtue, and watches over him while he sleeps. Tenth maxim, use time wisely. Follow your heart as long as you live. Do no more than is asked. Do not stint from following your heart. Wasting time is bad for the spirit. Do not fritter away time on daily chores beyond what is necessary to provide for your household. When wealth comes, follow your heart. Wealth amounts to nothing if one is indolent. Indolence is another word for lazy. Wealth does not come to those who are lazy, are not wealth worth owning that you can be 
proud of and feel worthy of anyway. 11th maxim, how to treat a son. If you are a man of virtue and produce a son by God's grace, if he is upright and takes after you, looks after your possessions in their proper place, do for him every good thing, for he is your son, so your spirit fathered him. Do not separate your heart from him, but progeny can make trouble. So if he errs, disobeys your advice, defies everything that is said, and goes about saying bad things, punish him for all his talk. He who crosses you is hateful to the gods. His guilt was decreed in the womb. He who was guided by the gods cannot go wrong, but he whom they make boatless cannot make a crossing. Twelfth maxim, how to behave in court. If you are in a court of law, stand or sit according to your rank, which was assigned to you on the first day. Do not transgress or you will be detained. Attention is paid to the one who enters properly announced. A seat is made ready for the one who was called. For a court of law has its standards. All conduct is measured. It is the God who gives advancement. Those who use their elbows are not rewarded. Thirteenth Maxim. Trustworthiness and Generosity. If you are with other people, gain for yourself supporters by being trustworthy. The trustworthy man who does not give free rein to his baser thoughts will himself become a leader. As for a wealthy man, what is his character? Your reputation is good, you are not spoken against, your body is well provided for, your face well regarded, you are boasted about without your knowing. But he who listens to his baser instincts replace love of him with dislike. His heart is empty, his body unanointed. The big-hearted person is God-given, while he who listens to his basic instincts is inimical. Fourteenth Maxim. How to behave as a messenger. Report your business without dissembling. Deliver your counsel in your master's hall. If he speaks fluently, it will not be difficult for the envoy to report accurately, nor will he be answered. Who is he to know it? It is the master whose business will go wrong if he plans to punish him for it, for he should be silent upon hearing, I have spoken. And that right there is could be used in the example of today of when you have to deliver information to those above you, superiors, people who manage you, when you're working for other people. At some point, everybody does. They have somebody they're reporting to on something. having the respect to not always speak back after someone has given a direct order, command, response. Again, deploying humility and saying less than necessary. Fifteenth maxim, how to behave as a leader. If you are a leader whose authority is unhindered, you should achieve many things. Be mindful of tomorrow. A dispute does not come in the midst of praises, but when the crocodile charges in, hatred arises. Sixteenth Maxim. How to deal with petitions. If you are a leader, listen quietly to the plea of the petitioner. Do not rebuff him from what he planned to say. A victim loves to vent his anger more than to achieve what he came for. As for someone who rebuffs a petition, it is said, why does he reject it? Not all that is petitioned for comes about, but a good hearing soothes the heart. This is so powerful because people often just want to be acknowledged and heard. The people petitioning and protesting, people who are in heights of emotion. Men often are very inefficient, ineffective, and poor at this. They want to be the fixer. I know I have. Want to fix people's problems when they petition to you something that bothers them. It is extremely soothing to the soul and heart if you just listen and acknowledge and be with someone through their pain and suffering and problems. Often that is enough. Seventeenth Maxim. Resist adulterous temptations. If you wish a friendship to last when you enter a house, as master, brother, or friend, whatever place you enter, beware of approaching the women. It is not a happy place where that is done. Revealing it is equally unwelcome. Men are easily diverted from what is good for them. A brief moment like a dream, then the realization is fatal. Shoot the opponent is cowardly maxim. When one goes to do it, the mind rejects it. He who is undone through lust... None of his plans will succeed. A man who can stay disciplined in the 
midst of temptation, lustful temptation particularly, is a man who is in control of his inhibitions. A man who succumbs, one could argue, is a man who is out of control, a man who is a slave to his inhibitions. So who do you want to be? 18th Maxim, do not be greedy. If you want your conduct to be good, rescued from evil, guard against the vice of greed. It is a grave and incurable disease. There are no treatments for it. It afflicts fathers and mothers and uncles. It drives apart wife and husband. It is a mix of everything evil, a combination of everything hateful. The man endures whose rule is truth, who walks in a straight line. Thus, he will make a testament. The greedy has no tomb. 19th Maxim Do not be greedy. Do not be greedy when sharing out. Do not covet more than your portion. Do not be greedy with respect to your relatives. The gentle man has a greater claim than the strong. He is diminished who betrays his family. He is deprived of conversation. A little of what is coveted renders a quarrelsome man cool-headed. 20th Maxim, how to treat a wife. If you are successful and establish your household, love your wife passionately, fill her belly, clothe her back, ointment is the proper prescription for her body, bring her joy as long as you live, for she is a fertile field for her master. Do not judge her, keep her from power, subjugate her, for her eye is tempestuous when she scrutinizes. She will be made to stay in your house if you restrain her. A woman left to her own devices is like water. When she's argumentative, make a trough for her. This is a note from the author. The last two lines of this 20th maxim are problematic and defy easy translation. The metaphor seems to be that a woman needs to be contained like rainwater, otherwise she runs away and is wasted. 21st maxim. How to treat friends. Please your friends with what you have, for it is due to God's favor. One who fails to please his friends, he is called a selfish spirit. One never knows what will be, even though one plans for tomorrow. The right spirit is the pleasing spirit. If praiseworthy acts are performed, friends will say, Welcome! Supplies are not brought to a town, but friends are fetched in a time of grief. 22nd Maxim. Avoid gossip. Do not repeat slander, nor listen to it. For it is the outburst of a hot temper. Report only a matter you have seen, not merely heard. If it is by the by, do not mention it. For your interlocutor recognizes virtue. An interlocutor is someone who engages in dialogue. If a theft is ordered and carried out, hatred will attach to the thief, according to the law. Mortal slander is a nightmare against which one covers one's face. 23rd Maxim. Know when to speak when to remain silent. If you are a man of virtue who sits in his master's hall, turn your mind to virtuous things. Your silence will be more effective than idle chatter. Speak only when you have thought of a solution, for it is only the skilled who should speak in the council. Speaking is more difficult than all other tasks. He who does it fluently makes it his servant. And don't we forget this one. Silence can often be more effective than idle chatter. Perhaps don't speak until you have a solution. Don't talk for the sake of talking to fill space. Write and think, think and write. And I believe that is a pathway to becoming a lot more articulate in order to make words your servant and master them. 24th Maxim, moderation in behavior. If you are powerful, gain respect through knowledge and pleasant speech. Do not command unless it befits. Hostility gets you in trouble. Do not be arrogant lest you be humiliated. Do not be silent lest you be rebucked. When you reply to the speech of a hothead, avert your face and control yourself. The ire of of the hothead sweeps by. He, he who treads carefully, his path is clear. He who is troubled all day long has no happy time, while he who is frivolous all day long cannot establish a household. 
but he who aims to complete a task is like someone who steers a matter safely to land, and another matter is held fast. He who listens to his heart will regret. 26th Maxim. How to curry favor with a superior. Teach an elder what is useful to him. Be his helper before the people. If you allow his wisdom to impress his boss, his gratitude will feed you. As the favorite's belly is satisfied, so your back will be clothed, and his help for you will in turn prosper your household. For your elder whom you love and who thrives by it, he will be a good shoulder to you. 27th Maxim. Impartiality in the exercise of justice. If you act as a magistrate commissioned to satisfy the many, uphold the impartiality of justice. When you give judgment, do not incline to one side. Take care lest someone should say, Judges, he is taking sides, and your deed turns into a judgment against you. We do this often. We bias a certain side of an argument. Naturally, we all have a proclivities towards certain agendas. But if you are to be a judger of yourself, of others, if we are to be better critical thinkers, perhaps we should practice not inclining to one side so often. And practice what it's like to be in the middle, to be the judge, the magistrate. 28th Maxim, forgiveness of past offenses. If you are merciful towards a misdeed and favor a man on account of his usual rectitude, pass over it, the misdeed, do not remember it, since he was silent towards you on the first day. And so this demonstrates how forgiving and forgiveness, particularly for people who have previously been kind and forgiving to you, can be of great value to maintain relationships, maintain friendships, maintain a positive respectful air of character. 29th Maxim, how to deal with material success. If you achieve greatness and you are from a humble background, if, and if you achieve wealth, having been poor in a town you know well and which knows about your former state, do not put your trust in your fortune, which came to you as God's gift, so that you will not fall behind another like you to whom the same thing happened. 30th Maxim, how to behave towards a superior. Bow to your superior, your overseer from the royal household, then your home will remain secure and your rewards as they should be. Wretched is he who opposes a superior. You thrive only as long as he is mild. When the barred arm is not bent in respect, do not rob a neighbor's house. Do not steal the possessions of someone close to you, lest he make a complaint against you before you are heard. A chatterbox is without wit. If he is known to be troublesome, a hostile man will be wretched in his neighborhood. 31st Maxim. Resist satisfying another man's lust. Do not have sex with a boy when you know that what is condemned will satisfy his desire. There is no cooling his lust. Let him not spend the night doing what is condemned. He will cool down only after he has mastered his desire. It is important to contextualize some of these maxims. Homosexuality, in the practice of it, was extremely rare and generally negative in ancient Egypt. And so when they reference he will cool down after he has mastered his desire, they're literally describing their baser instincts will cool and diminish after time. And it's important to comment and mention that just because there is one example of a maxim idea that someone purports that you may disagree with or may be quite different to today's era and time does not negate the value, relevancy, practicality of other things that they have said and other lessons and wisdom that they have purported. Just because you disagree with one piece of the puzzle doesn't mean the whole puzzle needs to be put in the bin. 32nd Maxim, how to deal with a troublesome friend. If you wish to investigate a friend's character, do not make inquiries, but approach him directly. Pursue the matter with him alone so that you do not suffer his displeasure. By all means, argue with him after a while. Test his disposition in conversation. If he lets slip what he has seen, 
or does something that angers you, be friendly to him nonetheless. Do not have a face-off. Be wary of revealing your true feelings to him. Do not answer with hostility. Do not break with him or humiliate him, for his time will surely come. One cannot escape one's fate. 33rd Maxim. Be generous. Be generous as long as you live, for what goes out of the storehouse does not come back in. It is bread for sharing that is coveted. He whose belly is empty is wont to complain. A sufferer becomes an opponent. Do not have him as a close neighbor. Kindness is a man's memorial for his years after power. 34th Maxim. Be generous. Know your neighbors, for they will be your prosperity. Do not be mean to your friends, for they are a well-watered field, greater than riches. One man's possessions are another's. A good man's good deeds profit him. A good character is memorial. 35th Maxim. Punish fairly. Punish with authority. Teach thoroughly. Then suppression of wrongdoing remains a good deed. Punishment that is not deserved turns a complaint into an opponent. And so this is to say, if you are and do have to punish, particularly relevant to parents, teachers, if you do have to apply negative reinforcement, back that up with a teaching, a thorough teaching, in order to make that negative reinforcement a good deed, an opportunity for learning. 36th Maxim, How to Treat a Wife. If you marry a woman who is plump and jolly and well known by her townsfolk, if she is faithful and time is kind to her, do not be driven apart, but let her eat, for her jollity brings contentment. And this uh, ideal of, of a woman in ancient Egypt uh, actually contrasted their art. The idealized portrayal of women in ancient Egypt was a slim woman. And the author noted this sentence is problematic. The translation offered here seems to fit the sense of the maxim. Basically, yes, it seems like what they're saying is what they're saying. And what a way to finish the 36 maxims from Patahu Tep. In reflection of these 36 maxims, how can we pick apart the commonalities? Where does success leave clues? What are the main takeaways. If you gave one word answers, they would be centered around discipline, respect for others, generosity for others, kindness for others, subverting authority, saying less than you think, staying calm in the face of a heated moment, being fair and being good, particularly around knowing how to speak in a measured, thoughtful and behave in a measured, thoughtful way that doesn't overstep the boundaries, that treats others ethically. That can be a loose word. Use that word loosely, some of these maxims, perhaps. But generally, the majority of these maxims teach you to deal with people with respect and kindness and generosity. And it's quite a remarkable thing where thousands of years later, could you imagine something that you wrote would be read by who knows how many hundreds of thousands of people thousands of years later. I'm sure Patahu Tep never even considered the thought. And I'm sure Patahu Tep didn't consider that his learning, his teachings would be relevant 2,000 years later 4,000, excuse me, in today's time. How remarkable is it that we can learn and take value to 
augment and orient our behavior to be better human beings, better communicators, better citizens, better friends, better family members for each other. As a result of the writings of an ancient Egyptian vizier all those thousands of years ago.